Hello and welcome to this webinar on preparing for the AP Stats exam hosted by NumWorks. My name is Nick Koberstein and I'm a math teacher in residence at NumWorks. I'm very excited to dig into all the statistical features of the calculator and work through a few former AP problems with you. I'm also going to include a few tips and best practices that you can use when taking the exam. Let's start by reviewing the format of the AP Statistics exam. The exam is split into two sections, the multiple choice section and then the free response section. The first section is multiple choice, which contains 40 questions, is worth 50% of the exam, and lasts for 90 minutes. The second part of the exam is the free response section, which contains six free response questions. While they're split into parts A and B, they are given all at the same time, with question six being an investigative task. If we dig a little deeper into the multiple choice section, you'll see that we are given exam weightings of the skills, so selecting statistical methods, data analysis, using probability and simulation, and then statistical argumentation. We can also look at the different topics um, and the units from the AP Statistics course. We can see exploring one and two variable data sets, collecting data, probability random variables and probability distributions, sampling distributions, and then a whole lot of inference. So proportions, means, chi-squared, and slopes, with those last two being the lowest weights. We're going to look today at some free response questions from former exams, and College Board has provided that in Part A, um, with our five questions, there will be at least one question that is a multi-part question with a primary focus on collecting data. Another question will have a primary focus on exploring data, then probability and sampling distributions, a question with a primary focus on inference, and then a question that combines two or more skill categories. Part B is that investigative task. It's going to assess multiple skill categories and content areas, focusing on the application of the skills and content in new contexts or non-routine ways. When using the NumWorks calculator for the AP Stats exam, you're going to primarily focus on four of the applications. The statistics application is for one variable data sets. That's when you're constructing histograms and box plots, cumulative frequencies, the normal probability plot, or looking for your summary statistics. If you've got a two variable data set, that's going to be the regression application. Here we can create scatter plots, find the correlation coefficient, the regression lines, and also do residuals and predictions. The distribution application is great for your probability distributions. So if you're doing probability work on the binomial, geometric, normal, T or chi-squared distributions, you'll want to use this application. The inference application, of course, is for inference. This is where you'll be constructing intervals and performing hypothesis tests. This is going to include means and proportions, whether it's one or two samples, your goodness of fit test, your homogeneity test, and your test for slope. At this point, we're going to switch over and look at a few uh, former AP Stats questions from past exams. So the first problem we're going to look at today is from the 2022 free response questions of the AP Statistics exam. Question three was asking about a machine at a manufacturing company that was programmed to fill shampoo bottles such that the amount of shampoo in each bottle is normally distributed with a mean of 0.6 liters and a standard deviation of 0.4 liters. We want to let the random variable A represent the amount of shampoo in liters that is inserted into the bottle by the filling machine. A bottle is considered underfilled if it has less than 0.5 liters of shampoo. We want to determine the probability that a randomly selected bottle of shampoo will be underfilled. We need to show our work. So the first thing we're going to do here is we're going to note that this is a normal distribution with a mean of 0.6 and a standard deviation of 0.04. And we're trying to find the probability that our random variable A is less than 0.5. We're going to open up the NumWorks graphing calculator and go into the distribution application. Here we can select our normal distribution and enter those parameters. So 0.6 for the mean and 0.04 for the standard deviation. 
Now we have a nice visual here, and we want to compute the probability that A is less than 0.5. Now this is a continuous random variable, so the probability that A is less than, or the probability that A is less than or equal to, is going to be the same. So I've already got the probability statement set up as being less than or equal to, so I just need to enter that value, 0 0.5, and hit OK. And we have our probability of 0 0.5. 0.0062. So 0 0.0062. Now I also want to show a little bit of work here, so I'm going to copy down this normal distribution just to show where this value came from. So I'm going to draw my normal distribution. I'm going to go ahead and show my mean of 0 0.6. And I'd like to, instead of writing every single sort of standard deviation, I'm just going to make a note that my standard deviation is 0 0.04. Now I've already done this up here, but this just helps demonstrate you know, my understanding that this is a normal distribution, where the mean is, where the standard deviation is. I'm also gonna show my picture um, with a 0 0.5 here, that value of interest, and the area shaded below and to the left, since that's the probability I was looking for. And that is enough to show my work here of uh, finding the probability from this normal distribution. Our next question also comes from the 2022 free response questions. This is question number four, which says that a survey conducted by a national research center asked a random sample of 920 teenagers in the United States how often they use a video streaming service. From the sample, 59% answered that they use a video streaming service every day. In this first part, we're asked to construct and interpret, construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of all teenagers in the United States who would respond that they use a video streaming service every day. To complete this problem, we need to construct that 95% confidence interval and then interpret it. To keep myself together through problems like this, I like to use my state plan do conclude format. For state, we need to state the action that we're going to complete. That is, we're going to construct a 95% confidence interval for the proportion of all teens in the United States who would say they use a streaming service every day. Now we need to plan how we'll do this. That is, we need to figure out what type of interval we're going to use and what conditions are required to use that interval. If the conditions are met, we're going to construct a one sample z interval for the proportion. To construct this interval, we need to check the three conditions random, large counts, and 10%. For the random condition, we need to ensure that our sample was a random sample. If we look back at the prompt, we see that they took a random sample of 920 teenagers. The large count condition requires that at least 10 people in the sample said yes, they do reuse the streaming service, and at least 10 said no. To check this, we'll check the sample size times the proportion that said yes, and the sample size times the proportion that said no. Let's pull out the NumWorks calculator to compute these values. That was 920 times 0.59 which is 542.8, which is at least 10, and then 920 times 1 minus 0.59, which is 377.2, again greater than or equal to 10. So our large counts condition is met. Finally, we need to ensure that while our sample size is large enough to meet large counts, it's not more than 10% of our population. Surely there are more than 10 times 920, that is 9,200 US teens, so our sample size is not more than 10%. Now that we've checked our conditions, we can go ahead and do, we can construct our confidence interval. To do this, once again, I'll go into the calculator and head into the inference application where I can uh, grab my intervals section. And again, we said we we're going to do a one proportion Z interval. That's my first option here. Um, at the top, you can see it says one sample Z interval for a proportion. 
my number of successes is the number of US teens who said yes, they do use a video streaming service every day. Um, that was 920 times 0.59, which this will round to 543 for me. Uh, my sample size was 920, and I am constructing a 95% confidence interval. On my next screen here, I have all the values I need to construct this. I'm going to go ahead and write those down. My p hat, my sample size, my p hat was 0 0.59. My z star critical value is 1.96. My standard error is 0 0.016, and my margin of error is 0 0.032. Now on this next screen, I have a nice visual here. I can see both my uh, confidence interval in interval notation on the number line there, as well as the uh, point estimate plus margin of error. So to wrap this question up, I'm going to go ahead and conclude. We are 95% confident that the true proportion of US teens who'd say they use a video streaming service every day is between 0 0.558 and 0 0.622. For our next question, we're going to switch to the 2021 AP Stats free response questions and look at question one. In question one, we're looking at the length of stay in a hospital after receiving a particular treatment, um, which is of interest to the patient, the hospital, and the insurance providers. Of particular interest are unusually short or long lengths of stay. So a random sample of 50 patients who received the treatment was selected and the length of stay in number of days was recorded for each patient. The results are summarized in the following table and are also shown in the dot plot. Now for part A here, which will be our focus, it's asked us to determine the five number summary of the distribution of length of stay. So again, we're looking for the minimum Q1, median Q3, and the maximum. What's nice here is that we were given the data in a table, which means we can use the statistics application to compute those values very quickly. So in the calculator, I'll head into the statistics application and input these values. So the length of stay was either five days, six days, seven, eight, nine, 12, or 21. And they conveniently gave me these frequencies, the number of patients, which was four, 13 had six days, 14, 11, six, one, and one. Now, if I head up into the statistics tab, we actually have our five number summary shown directly in the table. So we will copy these values down, making sure to label them. For our final question, we're going to jump all the way back to 2013 to look at question four. Question four is asking us to determine if the data provided in the table uh, provide convincing statistical evidence of an association between age group and whether or not a person consumes five or more servings of fruit and vegetables per day for adults in the U.S. Now, I'm not going to walk through the entire state plan do conclude for this problem, but just focus on how I'm going to use my calculator to help me answer this question. So again, I'd have to, of course, state my hypotheses, state my type of test, my check my conditions. Um, so I will assume you will do all of that, and then we'll just jump into the calculator to go ahead and get those important values. So in my calculator, I'm going to head into the inference application, back out of my previous work, and jump into the test section. Here we are looking at a chi-squared test. We're looking at a chi-squared test for uh, independence since we're looking for an association. You can see here that we do have a table that pops up, so I'm just going to start to fill this in exactly like I see on my paper. This will automatically expand as I type in these values, and I will not input the total values. That will show up automatically on my next screen. So I'm just going to fill in the uh, columns for yes and the columns for no, and then my three age groups. Once that is inputted, you can check your significance level and alter it if you need to. This problem did not identify a significance level, so we can keep that as 0.05. 
And then in the next section, we can see that we do have our expected values. So this is one of my conditions I would need to check, that all of these are at least five. Now I can head into the next section to get those very important values. I'll copy these down. My chi-squared test statistic, my chi-squared test statistic is 8.98. 3496. My p value, which I'll compare to my confidence, my significance level, is 0 0.0112, and my degrees of freedom is 2. The final screen here would give me a visual that I might want to sketch. Um, this is showing me the chi squared distribution. I can see my p value. Um, which is a very small area under that curve where my chi-squared test statistic is way out there at 8.98. Remember that p-value is 0 0.01, which is definitely less than my 5%, um, so I am going to go ahead and reject my null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. Again, we would need to write a statement about that, um, but I just wanted to focus on how I could use the calculator to determine those values. If I had a question then that followed up and asked me for specific contribution values, I can go back and up to the contributions tab to see how each of those different categories affected that chi-squared test statistic. Before we leave, I do want to leave you with a few general tips when taking the exam. On that free response section, it is a good idea to complete number one first, as it's supposed to be the easiest and least time consuming. Then you'll want to switch to number six, as this tends to take a lot of time and is heavily weighted. Be sure not to provide parallel solutions. That means don't have two different answers for the same question. If you do, they will grade the weakest one. So if you do switch your mind or change your mind, be sure to cross off the question you or the answer you don't want to use. Also, make sure you're aware of careless use of language. You want to make sure you're distinguishing between samples and populations. If you cannot get an answer to a part of a question, it's a good idea to make up a plausible answer and then use that for the remaining parts of the problem. You won't be penalized multiple times for using that as long as you're consistent going forward. Always make sure that with your intervals and your hypothesis test that you're checking the conditions required. Make sure you're also comparing when asked, so specifically comparing one mean to another or a mean to a median is going to be very important. Finally, do be careful in saying that data is normal. We usually want to use the word approximately normal when needed. Thank you again for joining me for this webinar. If you do have any questions, feel free to contact me directly at nick.coberstein at numworks.com or you can send an email to contact at numworks.com.